And we will begin today with an introductory presentation on Sports Without Borders by Dr. Haas Dalal, who is the Executive Director with the Australian Multicultural Foundation. We will then hear from Sash Herseg, a multicultural and community officer at the North Melbourne Football Club in uh, North Melbourne in Australia. And then we will move across the water to New Zealand, um, to Auckland, where we will hear from Dr. Arif Sayad, Community Coordinator with Refugees as Survivors in, in Auckland. Um, the session will end, as I said, with a moderated Q&A with our experts. Um, now, I would like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming our first presenter, Dr. Haas Dalal, Executive Director with the Australian Multicultural Foundation. Hello, Dr. Dalal. Welcome to Cities of Migration. Thank you very much, Kim, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share uh, with you and, and the world uh, uh, two worthwhile uh, innovative projects that we are conducting here in Australia. So um, thank you and uh, welcome to Action City Melbourne. Uh, firstly, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just briefly say that the Australian Multicultural Foundation is a, a not-for-profit organisation a trust that was established during Australia's bicentennial year by the then Prime Minister, and its primary aim is to promote a strong commitment to Australia as one people drawn from many cultures. Therefore, it undertakes projects and initiatives that are going to help uh, meet those uh, broad objectives, uh, but uh, more importantly, to fulfil our social cohesion agenda. And that's why we have uh, been active in partnering and developing uh, two uh, unique projects one being Sports Without Borders uh, and the other the North Melbourne Learning and Life Centre, which you'll hear from um, SACS in a minute. Uh, but firstly, the uh, Sports Without Borders is a not-for-profit organisation uh, which is dedicated to providing um, uh, uh, support for young people from migrant and refugee backgrounds who are involved or want to get involved in, in sports. Uh, we believe sports plays a, a vital role, and you'll see it in this slide here, uh, in building social cohesion in Australia as an engine of shared experience and empowering newly arrived Australians to develop friendships, identity and a sense of active belonging and improved health. Um, and sports with our borders role is to open up participation and pathways to sports by providing access to multilingual uh, resources and services and funding and direct financial support. We find the biggest obstacle for a lot of young people from non-English speaking backgrounds, particularly refugees, has been just very simple things. That, that to be able to buy shoes or sporting equipment or, or, or sporting jumpers and jerseys, just to participate or paying those sporting fees, which has created barriers uh, for their participation and sports without borders in partnership with government and the uh, private sector has been able to address some of these issues by providing the necessary support and funds for this. But by way of, um, and to give you, uh, I suppose, the, uh, a way of uh, an insight into in the changing demographics of Australia today, 40% um, of, uh, of Australia has one or more parent overseas. So a total of 8.8 .8 million people out of 21, 22 million population we have, 8.8 uh, .8 million uh, people have at least one parent born overseas. And this is going to significantly increase and is increasing and we'll see that in our new census in 2011. Uh, recent projections also by uh, Macro Plan Australia show that the migrant families will overtake the number of locally born families uh, by 2025. And in both Sydney and Melbourne, more than 50% of the population has one or more parent uh, born overseas. So combined with a non-English speaking uh, market in Sydney and Melbourne, uh, 3.4 million people equal to the combined population in our other two states of Western Australia and South Australia. And I think another interesting phenomenon for us, in fact, is that 82% of Australian student intake is from Asia, and over the next 20 years, 50% of our population growth will be driven by culturally and linguistically diverse community immigration, and two-thirds of these migrants will arrive from Asia and will settle, 60% will settle in New South Wales and Victoria. Another interesting uh, fact that statistic in all of this is that uh, there has been also a, a, a decline in, in sports. A recent Australian Sports Commission, as you'll see in the survey uh, uh, PowerPoint in front of you, uh, concluded that uh, the relevance of sport is declining in relevance to the new generation. 
and you'll see with Gen Y and Gen X and the boom, and baby boomers, uh, the preferences of types of recreational activities. Uh, and I suppose for us, uh, sports, the, the primary aim for Sports Without Borders was to close this gap by addressing sports needs of uh, communities uh, so that we can drastically ease the sports participation crisis and increase the relevance of sports across Australia, simply because we believe that it provides for uh, a unique opportunities for young people to be able to engage further, but more importantly, to, uh, to help uh, improve and, and further our social cohesion agenda by investing in our young people as, uh, as, as I suppose, uh, as the promised uh, leaders for the future. But more importantly, I think it also has uh, for us an important factor in bridging those cultural gaps and stereotypes that are created uh, with, with any uh, city uh, that is uh, culturally diverse. And we find by uh, providing these opportunities, particularly for young refugees or new arrivals, um, sports has played an important role in breaking down some of those barriers and allowing for participation uh, within our community, not only for the young people, but also the families of those young people, as uh, we have seen some uh, excellent results in, in, in participation, particularly around uh, civic obligations and civic duties. And, and it also has started to increase that sense of belonging, as we find that people feel that they belong, uh, they feel that they are uh, more confident to participate in, in general activities within their community. So with Sports Without Borders, uh, we have, um, have, just before, uh, you can see now uh, that the types of projects that we support uh, as I stated earlier, to help young people with transport and travel, uh, to help them with uh, international scholarships, registration fees, and, and also with equipment. And, and what this really does is, is give them uh, a much better opportunity to uh, access what uh, is being offered uh, within, within our community. Next, uh, we'll move to some of the other um, projects and areas, we, we look at a sustainable events model, and obviously with such uh, events, it's very important that we develop those important partnerships with local councils, uh, government, uh, uh, other educational institutions, and the corporate sector, uh, in order that people all feel that they are able to participate and, and make some sort of valuable contribution uh, to, to the social cohesion agenda in Australia. And, and as you can see before you, uh, we have um, looked at a number of, um, uh, provided a number of uh, projects and, and sample projects to give you an idea of the types of things that we are actually doing in terms of capacity building models, uh, targeting the existing projects and also specific community projects as well. Um, one of the uh, interesting projects that we're currently involved in is what we call the Mass Participation Model, which is called Youth Action. And this event is uh, modeled around um, a large group of children who are taken through an organized technology-driven sports activity process. And it is a tool for uh, councils to reach major groups of young people and also provide measures to improve their health outcomes within the local communities themselves. Uh, the, the initiative is uh, from Sports Without Borders and is uh, pretty much currently focused on newly arrived refugee children uh, of multicultural background. And uh, for further information, simply because we have very limited time here, uh, and uh, I, I'm happy to uh, participate in the question and answer that people may have, um, if you need further information about Sports Without Borders, uh, we've just put up before you a website. Uh, which gives you uh, further information, detailed information of the types of activities uh, that Sports Without Borders is involved in, and also the types of and, and the communities that we actually uh, work with uh, within here in, in Victoria. Um, I, I'd like to also say that the Sports Without Borders uh, initially did start as a, a, a Victorian uh, organisation, but now is very much uh, a national organisation uh, looking at uh, uh, establishing partnerships right across Australia at all levels so that we can actually make a difference. Thank you. Um, Kim, did you want me to introduce um, 
Uh, Seth? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lal. It was very, very good. I would, I welcome. Yes, please do introduce uh, our next speaker. Speaker. Uh, if I can call on uh, Sasha, who, is, uh, who will make a presentation on the um, huddle, what we call the huddle, the Learning and Life Centre here at North Melbourne, uh, which is uh, part of a, a, a lodge, I suppose, embedded within an elite sporting club uh, uh, in the Australian Football League, and that's the North Melbourne Football Club. And I invite Sasha to give us a bit more information about that uh, unique project. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Kim, and thank you everyone joining us this morning. Um, it, it's fantastic to have this opportunity to connect and share with um, with the world and the team. So um, maybe I'll give you some background. I guess with the first slide, it gives you some, I guess, demographic statistics in terms of where we're based, and it also gives you some information about the club. So North Melbourne Football Club is an elite sporting club uh, that com competes in the Australian Football League, and we are based in North Melbourne, which is within the city of Melbourne, and it's probably worth noting as well that Melbourne is one of the most uh, modernist and culturally diverse cities in the world, and we, we, I guess high 140 nations who live side by side, uh, who all came here by, I guess, by four main um, ways of migration. So I guess you can see that from our ge geographic location, it's very clear that um, our backyard, as we call it, is very multicultural. So therefore, communities that we engage are very, um, I guess, multicultural by its nature. So luckily, a couple of years ago, we were able to partner up with two fantastic organisations in Australian Multicultural Foundation and Scanlon Foundation, and the result of of, I guess those partnerships is formation of the Huddle Learning and Life Centre at North Melbourne Football Club. Um, I guess we are a department within the club that is given the task of engaging with our local community and the way we do that at our club is via the three engagement streams uh, which you can see on the next slide. So the first stream is education programs, um, we've got homework programs and community programs, which is, a, I guess, a very broad, um, very broad field. So the thing that links all of those streams together is our focus on multicultural communities and also the fact that we're not bound by football. So I guess in that sense we're very unique in, in the Australian Football League that we don't necessarily provide programs directly focused on football. Um, as a result, some of our programs involve netball and volleyball and journalism and photography workshop. So very broad. Um, I might also point out that all our programs are free of charge to participants, um, which sort of goes back to, to some of the obstacles facing our multicultural communities. Um, what I'd like to do now is just give you a, a quick overview of, of two programs we're currently running involving migrants and refugee um, I guess communities. First one involves an organisation called Adult Multicultural Education Services, which is basically which is an organisation providing settlement services to newly arrived migrants um, and refugees to Australia. So the program that we run is based on sport and recreation, which we felt that our I guess newly arrived communities don't really get exposed to. And the program focuses on not only providing that I guess sporting activity, but also teaching the the structure of sport in Australia which is also one of the obstacles of participation, I guess, um, in sport in Australia. So I guess the ideal objective of that program would be providing some participation pathways to our um, participants. Another program that we're running at the moment is North Melbourne Football Club Multicultural Academy. Um, as the name suggests, it is specifically aimed at multicultural children. So the criteria for that academy itself is that either the participant or one of the parents is born overseas. Uh, I guess in that case, football is used as a, let's call it a hook, to bring these children into the club. And what it really is about is off-field development. So during the course of the academy, which is five engagements throughout the year, uh, the, the children, I guess, are involved in some off-field development, as I said, uh, which involves positive education, um, leadership, health and nutrition, um, and so on. Um, I might just mention another couple of programs that, that we run, I guess, that contribute to participation and just general involvement um, in sport, which are match visits. So our migrants and refugee communities are, I guess, invited as guests of ours 
to come to our games, and we also do quite a lot of work with international students. Um, I guess that leads me to benefits to our community, and I've listed a few on the slide there, but I guess overarching everything, um, that the main benefit to our community is, I guess, our contribution to social cohesion. So I guess all our programs try to bring in that aspect of mainstream community uh, mixing with our multicultural community. I guess assisting in social cohesion, um, and another, I guess another overarching benefit is community capacity building. So what we would like to contribute is we want basically our communities to be self-sustainable, and what I mean by that is I want our community, or we want our communities to be knowledgeable and informed communities. And at the moment, uh, I guess the best tool for us is I guess our players. We are, as I said, the least sport. And Probably worth mentioning as well that football in Melbourne is almost a religion. So people do know what football is and people do follow it. Um, and it's a very good way, I guess, to integrate into the community by football. So as I mentioned, players are a very important component of the huddle. Um, they have been very successful with quite a few players involved today. And they all, I guess, they, they all enjoy what they do and, and they all really believe in our underpinning principles of social cohesion and community capacity building so that they're very dedicated to providing their time um, and efforts to our program despite their busy schedules as elite athletes. Um, and that, that sort of leads us to some of the key learning um, we've, we've, I guess, come to know so far. And, and I guess the first one is to know your community because each community is different and each community has different needs. Um, one of the other very important learning so far is, is to seek like-minded organisations or clubs to partner. Um, I guess from our experiences, there's no point in linking up with someone who doesn't share your, your objectives. Uh, next point, I guess, is building trust, and that's a very obvious one. You know, if, you, if you want to work with the community, you need to build that trust. Um, another thing which is very interesting we found with working with migrant and refugee communities is maintain consistency with your program. Um, by that I mean maintain the same time, same venue um, for all your programs. And I guess last but not least, do make sure that it is fun uh, for everyone participating in those programs. Um, I guess I would like to close with that and, and perhaps say thank you to Matri and thank you to everyone um, for listening and I'm very happy to participate in, in any further questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Sash. That, that, was, that was excellent. We'll be able to return to some of some of that later um, from you in the huddle. I like that, the huddle. Um, and now I, I would like to um, we'll move from Australia, travel across the water to, to New Zealand and, and Auckland. I'd like to now introduce you to Dr. Arif Said, who is the community coordinator of refugees as survivors from, uh, from Auckland. Um, Dr. Said has uh, joined the, the uh, community services team at Refugees as Survivors um, in 2001 after having served for a time as a medical doctor in Afghanistan for Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, but, and so in addition to his concerns for, for the health aspects, benefits of the game, he, he, he identifies sport as one, one of the key areas um, for helping refugee youth and integration. Um, to overcome resettlement challenges, and, and in fact, Dr. Saeed founded the Refugees in Sports Initiative at um, Refugees and Survivors in, in Auckland. And so we'd very much like to welcome Dr. Saeed and hear more about um, his success there. Welcome to Cities of Migration, Dr. Saeed. Uh, thank you, Kim, and good morning from Auckland. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to let us uh, share our project with you all around the world. Um, uh, before I talk about the, our project, just a brief about uh, our New Zealand and especially in Auckland. Um, refugees coming to New Zealand, almost 40% of them stay in uh, Auckland and the rest of them move to the other cities. In our organization um, is uh, Refugees of Survivors, which uh, we are mainly a mental health organization, but we are working on all other aspects of health as well. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, previous uh, speakers mentioned, like Dr. Hart mentioned, 
about the um, sport in barrier for refugees is the same. I think it's the same issue all around the world for refugees. A sport is the last thing that they will think of on top of the all other resettlement issues they are going through. They, and also the second point is that the cost, the cost is also an issue for refugee family, families as well. So what we have done so far is we started in 2006, the project we initiated, initiated in 2006, the main challenge for us at the beginning was how to reach youth, refugee youth in the community. We had to motivate the families, the community, and also we also needed to find some resources, find some um, fund for how to help refugee families. So in collaboration and partnership with uh, Auckland City, with um, uh, local funders, with government, and also with the uh, local clubs, and also especially with the New Zealand Soccer Federation, we initiated this project. And as soccer is the main sport from, for most of the refugees coming from around the world, so that was the main point to start. Soccer was the best uh, attraction point for youth. So we started with soccer and then we extended to, um, to cricket and to uh, swimming, to martial arts and also uh, to uh, tennis as well. We have some girls in tennis and swimming uh, sports as well. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, what we do uh, regarding the, the, the issue of um, cost, we subsidize 50% of the membership for clubs if refugee youth are joining the club, and also 50% of their equipment, the gears they need for that particular sport. And also, um, getting funding is an issue always, but uh, we are lucky we got the uh, local, uh, we got the uh, Milk and Pacific, uh, at the moment, they are supporting us, and also before that, uh, Auckland City did support uh, our program, uh, but uh, still we are, uh, we, are, we are doing well. We have uh, had more than 400 uh, youth who are going through our uh, program, and also the main events which we saw for in the last, uh, from last, end of last year, we organized one was the outdoor soccer. Outdoor soccer was um, uh, 16 youth refugee uh, teams. They joined with the uh, soccer clubs and plus uh, soccer uh, clubs from a school, local schools. They joined as well. Uh, refugees as survivors, we have our, our own team as well, which is uh, you can see on the um, uh, PowerPoint at the moment is a multicultural team. Um, refugees from all uh, different countries. And um, also, um, this is our All Rift team. All Rift team is, um, wo has won the um, last tournament, which was um, in the end of last year, the outdoor tournament. We won the cup with another uh, foot who will come in the next slide. And also, at the moment, we, are organized, uh, we have organized another um, uh, soccer event, which is indoor. And that, uh, that uh, event is more than uh, 16 refugee teams. Every Sunday they get together and they play. The image you can see is also a uh, cricket team which we supported them with the equipment they needed. Uh, some of our uh, success, uh, successes uh, was in the, the first uh, successful point for us was the partnership with the local sports clubs, with the schools, with the government organizations, with non-government organizations and funders. So that made our project more successful. And what we have done so far, the soccer tournament, the swimming program, the cricket program, martial arts class. Uh, the martial arts class which uh, we are supporting at the moment is around 50 to 60 youth are coming regularly twice a week and uh, playing there. We also, um, uh, our program has been uh, recognized by an award from uh, New Zealand Human Rights, the Refugees and Sport Initiative. 
And uh, another group of refugees which we helped in the last six months was um, called the Community Max in partnership with the um, government organization funded in uh, that uh, program. They won. They attended the one of the the conference, the FIFO conference um, in Auckland. In uh, in uh, they won a project for uh, four thousand US dollar um, uh, program. And that is why, at the moment, that uh, indoor soccer tournament is running. And um, as I mentioned, soccer is also a sport in general, but soccer is a universal language and culture. It has got its own culture. It doesn't need the language if you are from. You can play in a in, in a team. So. This is the main point to integrate and it uh, helps refugees to uh, get more um, involved in the community, in wider community, I mean, and also it uh, helps them for better settlement. Uh, we are also working on other projects which we will start uh, from next year is a refugee youth leadership uh, program, which uh, in the last uh, two months we had three um, uh, leadership camps for around 90 youth from different refugee communities. Uh, those youth, they um, were identified by their communities and they attended a youth leadership camps and uh, among them we identified some uh, very talented uh, youth leaders, which uh, we are hoping to get them involved in the next year project, which will start in next year. And uh, I think that's all from us. If there is any question, we are more than happy to Answer. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Saeed. You've also given us some uh, some links that we'll be able to uh, follow up. They'll be available online. So we've now concluded the formal um, part of our presentation, part of our webinar, um, and we've had some uh, three very uh, interesting initiatives and multiple projects within them described to us. Um, and we have a number of questions coming in. Um, that we'd like now to uh, put before you. But I think what we'll start with is a, is a question um, about, about partnership. It seems to have been an important theme in each of the, um, the presentations that we um, heard. And um, so what I'd like to know is, is to ask you um, is, that given how important partnership has been to the success of your initiative, um, beyond sort of how the partnerships have contributed uh, to the success, what, have, what, what did you do to um, engage the partners that you have? What, what, what was it about the way you've worked with your partners that um, has resulted in so much success and ongoing investment? And maybe we could uh, start with, um, with with Dr. Zaid, who I know has had a, a wonderful relationship with Malcolm Pacific, a corporate um, group in, in Auckland, um, and that they became involved in the initiative when things weren't quite looking quite as, as bright, but they've been a, an important partner. So I don't know, Dr. Saeed, what have you, um, you know, why, do, why does Malcolm Pacific do it and, and what, uh, what is it, what magic are you doing there that makes that partnership so successful? Uh, thank you, Kim. Um, I believe if uh, our future is in the hands of uh, today's youth. So if you want a better future, we must invest in our youth today. So for that reason, and also we have a very close collaboration with New Zealand police, and we uh, also hear from them what's happening. So we involve communities, refugee communities, I mean, and plus the local government and non-government organizations to look at the youth, what is going to happen to our generation, this youth generation, if we do not take care of them or if we do not support them. So by bringing the issue up in attention to all the um, people who are working around the uh, in, uh, stakeholders with the refugees, like uh, police, like um, government organizations, like NGOs, like refugee communities, all together, that helped us to initiate this program and bring the helper or bring the funders on board to help us. At the moment, we are in another 
um, project, working on other projects which I mentioned before about the resourcing with youth leadership. That is going to be in partnership with ESP Community Trust and MSD in Ministry of um, Youth Development, Ministry of Social Development, so they all realize there is a need. There is a need to support and invest in our youth. So that is the point how we brought all the, our partners together. That's that's very interesting, and and how and uh, Sash, how how um, how how have you leveraged uh, so much success with your local partnerships? Um, I guess the biggest partnership we can make, and we should concentrate on with our communities. Um, I guess following that, it's very important, as I pointed out in the in the presentation, that we find organisations that are like-minded, that have similar objectives. And I guess that's the key. Um, if, if we find common language in our objectives, uh, things are very easy to follow on from there. So I guess, I guess that's, the, that's the key from us. And I guess without Cassie, we're very fortunate that we were able to find um, fantastic partners in, in Australian Multicultural Foundation and in Scandal Foundation. That's, that, that's very interesting. And, and were, were your partners um, actively involved in, in promoting your work? and? Um, uh, sharing the, uh, the communication uh, communication tool with you? I guess considering that our project is still in embryonic stages, we are still, I guess, working out um, both communication strategies, but I, I would like to think that we contribute to each other's um, communication and, and promotion. Mm -hmm. um, and also, one thing that I sort of, I guess, forgot to point out is what we're also trying to do is, is build partnerships with other sporting codes. Uh, as an example, Netball Victoria and Netball Australia, we've got quite a good partnership with. And what we're trying to achieve is expose other sports to our community, especially most cultural communities. Um, again, trying to, well, I guess, aiming to improve that uh, participation and integration through sport. That's great. Um, you partially answered a, a question that came in from, from someone in our audience, from Andrew Pragnell. He asked, uh, what, uh, to what extent do mainstream sports clubs in New Zealand and Australia need to make their club environments accessible and open to migrant and refugee youth? And, and what are the first steps required by the major codes in this respect? And um, I guess by codes, we, we're, we're talking about the games themselves. Um, is that correct? Maybe. Uh, uh, Dr. Saeed, would you like to comment there? Sorry, I didn't hear the, um, uh, one part of your question. Can you please repeat the question? The question was, um, to what extent some of the mainstream sports clubs in, in Auckland, um, the, point, the point was that a lot of the mainstream sports clubs need to make their club environments more accessible and more open to migrant and re refugee youth. And, uh, the Andrew Pagnell was asking whether you had any suggestions for, for what first steps might be um, that might help some of those mainstream sport clubs um, come more open to uh, the, some of the migrant and multicultural communities. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, what, what we did here was we started with the uh, New Zealand Soccer Federation, which all the other soccer uh, clubs are almost under uh, their uh, <coughs> uh, management or rules. So uh, David Parker from uh, New Zealand Soccer Federation, he helped us a lot in negotiation, negotiation with the local soccer clubs to accept refugees, even though if they need some um, uh, coaching. New Zealand Soccer Federation provided some coaching for our refugee teams as well, for uh, youth, refugee youth uh, you, uh, coach as well. So with collaboration with Soccer Federation, then Soccer Federation announced or um, um, advised all the local soccer clubs to be more cooperative with refugee community, with refugee youth. That was the successful point for us to reach the local club. Hmm. That's very good. Should I? Please, uh, Hass, Hass. Yeah. No, Hass. Oh, sorry, Hass. Excuse me, Dr. Dalal. Yes? Yeah, if I could just add here, um, 
Uh, we find also within the uh, Australian experience that, I mean, you, you need to also face the reality when it comes to some of the elite sporting clubs. And that is, of course, they're looking for new, market, new markets and new audiences as well. So if you can show how they can actually uh, kill two birds with one stone, as you might want to say, is here is a new audience uh, that needs uh, developing uh, encouragement and participation so that you can attract from your community this new, new audience that can appreciate the sport, but at the same time you are becoming a good corporate citizen uh, by providing uh, opportunities for people to participate and be part of a community through a, an elite sporting club. So they fulfill their, I suppose, what we call out their corporate or um, uh, obligations to the community. And we're finding in Australia, particularly with the elite sporting clubs, there are more and more evidence and more and more a willingness to engage in this sort of work at the community level. Get to understand your community. Uh, does your sporting club actually reflect the diversity of your community, not with only its players, but also with its membership? So if it doesn't, then there is something wrong here. Uh, you can't go around and call yourself a, a club that is open for all if you don't necessarily have the cultural or, or the, uh, the strategies that is going to actually reflect that in the way you project yourself as an organisation. So we're finding that many of these sporting clubs are undertaking audits, community consultations at different levels to understand their community and their audiences and what their needs are. So within that they are finding these gaps where young refugees or newly arrived communities are, are unable to participate for a number of reasons. It could be simple as language, it could be the fact that they feel that they've been discriminated against or a la a lack of accessibility of services. So the clubs, through the disorders, find out what they need to do and how they can then actually make some sort of contribution through their own programs and come up with these new innovative initiatives so that they can attract these, uh, attract new audiences and young people to their clubs, not only from, uh, from an educational point of view, but also uh, looking to the future. Because we're now seeing in a lot of our clubs, particularly in the second B grades and C grade teams that they have, a, a, a true reflection of what that community is in terms of its diversity. And I think this becomes then part of the culture of that organisation. It's no longer some sort of attachment or an appendices to something. It is uh, unique in itself that it is truly inclusive. And I think this is the agenda that is currently running through Australia, not only through the, uh, the sporting club, but right across the board where they look at local councils and even the corporate sector. I mean, why would the corporate sector want to get involved in this? Simply because they're starting to realise that they have huge corporate responsibilities in terms of if they cannot uh, maintain social cohesion within their community, it's going to affect everyone right across the board so that they are undertaking a number of initiatives and research strategies. And we're finding that sport is becoming a, a, a unique vehicle in overcoming some of these uh, issues and challenges for us. Thank you. That, that, I think that's right. And, uh, and it's very, the, the whole challenge of, of uh, creating representative sort of communities um, through, through things like sport are an, are an important part of uh, gaining the investment we need to, to, to make the, uh, these initiatives successful. Um, and throw, you know, there's a, there is also, of course, the practical and very commercial side of it, that it makes business sense to, to, invest, to recognize um, uh, untapped uh, the, uh, audiences and, and, uh, and how important they are to the future of the sport. We have a question from Ronald Jacobs at Omega in Auckland who, who looks at asks a, a question about cost. He thanks uh, you all for uh, informative presentations and says that he's interested in the concept of cost um, and uh, uh, specifically the funds, funds always being a challenge, he says, yet payment, he knows, often increases participation. So um, he wants to ask you to elaborate on your thinking about the effectiveness of part funding. Um, uh, would you like to well, present, um, maybe... If, I can, if I can say something Pat here, Pat yeah. Bilal, uh, uh, we, find, we, we have found that uh, uh, well, obviously the, the funding issue is, is, some, is something of a challenge. Uh, the model that we've actually found, and uh, as Sash indicated earlier, if you find like-minded 
organisations, uh, whether in you know private sector or government. Uh, we've developed a model, for example, if I can use an example, we have a unique partnership with the Scanlon Foundation, which is a, 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 a private enterprise foundation trust that has undertaken uh, a lot of work in the social cohesion uh, area and, and undergoing research and developing projects. Uh, but more importantly, it wants to be actively involved. What we have developed for them and, and what they've seen is that they provide funds as leverage. So they will give funds to, let's say, North Melbourne or the uh, Sports Without Borders, X amount of dollars, which we then can go to government, other corporate sectors and local councils to say that we are coming in with support and funds from the corporate sector and how can you match these funds? So therefore what we get is a much more sustainable program of a longer term. We are no longer thinking in Australia, particularly in the case of the Scanlon Foundation, projects over three years, but we look at projects over now seven years. Oh. And the only way to do that is to develop uh, good and solid partnerships. So this leverage fund helps us go to go to government and they put their hands in their pocket, the local councils, they put their hands in their pocket, as well as other corporate sectors. And we find that builds a unique partnership but a more sustainable program for the future, which then starts to develop its own character and longevity. Thank you. That, that's excellent. And, and would you like to add anything to that, uh, Dr. Zaid? Um, uh, yes, uh, I agree with Dr. Haas. The first thing is that you uh, need to find the right uh, people to talk to and in, introduce your project. The second point is, uh, for example, we have a, a project that is going to be funded by the Community Trust for three years next year. The first point that we have funded 50% for refugee, community, refugee youth was if uh, the, the, the fund came from, first came from Oakland City and then Oakland City they, their fund was restricted to certain areas. Then we had to, we could not uh, support all refugees from around Auckland. Then we came to Malcolm Pacific, we found them, and then they are interested to fund us for 50%. Uh, but it's still sometimes for some refugee community uh, families, uh, other 50%, there's also an issue. Some of the families might have some issue. We will try to reduce as much as possible the cost for refugee families. The first and second year, once their children got into a sport, then the wheel starts rolling. Then this is easy. So the first year is difficult. We must be careful with the first and second year to get the children into a sport in the family to understand the benefit of the sport. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very wise, very wise strategy. Now we've got a lot of questions that are starting to come in. I have an interesting question from Karishma, who asks. Um, she says, in addition to attracting people to clubs. To what extent are these initiatives community-led? Um, and so I was wondering, maybe Dr. Sayed, you could um, comment there um, about uh, the, uh, the extent to which community um, is leading some of the activities you've undertaken um, through RIS. Yes. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> we have a regular meetings with the refugee community leaders. Uh, those uh, refugee community leaders, through them, we identify what is needed in their community or what, uh, what their community, youth in their community, they are interested in. So from that point, we take it on, and from there we go. I mentioned uh, at the beginning soccer, because when the, we had the first meeting with the community leaders, the only thing they wanted for their youth was soccer, soccer. Everything they talked was about soccer. So we started with soccer. Then we end up to see that girls are not participating that much in soccer. Then we had to initiate something else or, or encourage the community to come with something else, like tennis. Tennis was the second point that the communities come with tennis. And now we have some children, some youth who are involved with the, uh, hockey and also with the netball as well. So that is coming from the community. We have regular meetings with the community leaders and they advise us what, what is needed in their community or what is their youth are interested in. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. And, and how about you, Sash, in, in, in Melbourne? Um, uh, how many of your initiatives are, are initiated by uh, community uh, leadership? Well, I, I would go as far as saying that pretty much majority of our programs are community initiated. Um, as a precursor to <coughs> 
excuse me, as a precursor to the formation of Learning a Life Centre, there was an extensive um, community, I guess, community consultation done. Yeah. So obviously, depending on the finding, findings that um, I guess resulted from that consultation, we've gone and developed our strategy in terms of community engagement. So I guess as a result, a lot of them are driven by our community directly. That's very good. Our next question from Wayne Leslie, um, and we'll just get a quick response from, from all three of you on this one, please. Wayne Leslie from the British Columbia Ringette Association asks, as an ICE Sport. We are curious about strategies that encourage participation in a sport not as entrenched in other cultures, uh, for example, where ice sports are not common, um, if indeed they exist at all. Do you have any suggestions? How do you involve diverse communities in um, something as uh, culturally specific, perhaps, ice? <laughs> uh, how about you, Sash, do you want to start? Yeah, I guess, I guess we share um, a bit of an issue there with, um, I think, is it Wayne? Yeah. Um, I guess Australian football is a, by its name or nature um, is very specific to Australia and, and is not really played worldwide um, to, to a large extent. So the majority of migrants and refugees coming to Australia, uh, I guess, come with the knowledge of soccer mainly and basketball and other obviously popular sports in Western cultures. So we face the same issue. And I guess the AFL, which is the I guess the, the overarching body um, in Australia for our sport has gone down, down the path of going through schools, um, in particular schools with a large uh, proportion of migrants and refugee children, and I guess developed programs um, for those children. So they're, they're generally four to six week programs uh, which during the course, or I guess during the course of which parents are involved in some stages as well. So I guess parents are introduced to that sport as well. But it is, I mean, it is, it is an issue and, and more often than not, um, communities who want to play soccer. Hmm. That's very interesting. How about uh, how about uh, uh, Said? Uh, do you would you like to respond to this question? Sure. I think if you initiate any uh, project or anything you want to do with refugee communities, it uh, must be in consultation in agreement with them, whatever they come. Yeah, we had a um, refugee uh, forum, National Refugee Forum here in uh, Wellington. Um, the main um, theme was that nothing with us, uh, not, uh, nothing about us without us. So when you initiate a project or whatever you want to do, if you do it with negotiation, work with the community, and you come and collaborate with them, that project definitely will be successful and the community will accept. If you go with something you want to do and they don't know and they are not aware, that I don't think that will work. Hmm. That's, um, thank you. And, and in terms of actually um, attracting diverse uh, audiences to um, mainstream events, how, in terms of strategies you would recommend to um, host communities and uh, mainstream sports clubs of various kinds, well, what, do you have a strategy to offer them about how to engage, um, in, increase the levels of diversity, make them more representative of the community? What do they have to do uh, to make their games open and inclusive? Um, uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Dalal, yes? Uh, I, uh, I think that was Dr. Saeed. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Saeed? Oh, yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, before we start with soccer, for example, uh, we see lots of uh, refugees. They uh, are interested in soccer, but we did negotiate, we did uh, discuss with their families, with their uh, with their communities as well, and then they come with the idea of soccer. So then we in we we introduce them to the so local soccer club. They were also. First of all, the the clubs were hesitant to accept refugees, and also community, refugee communities also, they were not so confident to go to the club and enroll their children into the club. So we mediated with in between the clubs and the community. So we meet, uh, we are in meetings between them, between the community and between the club. The community get to know and understand the, the culture of the club and the club got to understand and know the culture of the community. So that was the way it worked with us, for us and then once they got mixed with the local and with wider community, then that's it. All refugees 
Uh, we, if, if um, we have uh, in the, so one of the, our foot you saw there, we have uh, every Sunday we have a soccer tournament indoors. Refugees from all around the world who are in Israel, they are, they are playing in the same club. So 16 teams playing almost every Sunday. It's wonderful. It really is. Um, all right, we're going to move on to another question. This one's a difficult question from Matthias Golob. He asks, how do your organizations address some of the negative aspects of Western sports? Um, what he describes here is hierarchical ordering and, and some of the violence associated with um, some of the football clubs, for example. Um, do you have specific measures in place to, to manage um, that dimension of sport? Um, maybe, um, Sash, would you like to answer this question from North Melbourne? Sure, sure. I guess that question, or the answer to that question is probably um, state or even national sporting bodies. They need to lead by example and, and introduce policies and rules, I guess. They, they try to eliminate um, those examples from sport. I, I, guess, I guess it is very difficult to, to eliminate every single example, but in, at least in, in Australia's case, uh, sporting bodies have led, by example, um, to at least tackle the issue. Hmm. Can I, it's a very uh, good, that's a very good answer. So leadership on this. Um, and I'm yeah, sorry, was that Sash who wanted to, or not Dr. Dalal? No, that was Pat. Yeah, that's right. So I can just further attack Dalal here. Um, we here uh, in Australia, let's say within the football world, um, we have the Australian Football League who are a very active peak uh, association that um, looks after uh, the interests of all of the uh, elite sporting clubs. But they also play a very important social role and have introduced a number of strategies and uh, what you could call maybe legislation from a, 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 a football association with regards to issues of racism, discrimination, domestic violence and, uh, and, and violence in general. In, in sporting codes, not only within the elite sporting clubs, but right at the local community level. So there are uh, unacceptable uh, and acceptable codes uh, within that, that are not are only just words, but are also uh, a lot of money is spent in, in promotion, in uh, uh, advertisement, and material of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable on, uh, on a sporting field. Um, and that not only goes with football, but I think uh, we, we're now adopted with a lot of the major codes and associations right across the board with all of the other codes as well. And, and this is uh, very much becomes a very uh, heated public uh, issue and debate at any time when such incidences of racism, discrimination or violence because of racism uh, is, is becomes evident through some of these uh, uh, sporting um, events. Mm. Uh, thank you. So, uh, so, so, making people aware that that, um, that 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 there are policies in place and 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 guidelines, and and making them stick, I guess, is the important message there. I'm going to switch gears now and to uh, give you a question from Rick Beaver at the Ontario Ministry of Health Promotion here in Canada. He asks whether uh, he's interested in research on, or data on obesity levels or fitness levels of new immigrants and uh, whether you're collecting data in this area, whether it has an impact on your program design. So I guess I'd like uh, Dr. Saeed perhaps can address this question, um, the extent to which sporting, sports clubs like your own are uh, addressing health promotion issues um, as well as co community cohesion issues. Dr. Saeed? <coughs> can you just repeat the question, please? Um, do, does, does your organization work with local health authorities um, to promote um, sport as uh, the health benefits of sport? Um, there's a lot of research on ethnicity and health these days, and in North America, an awful lot of interest in rising obesity levels, especially in the young. And so I think uh, Rick Beaver at the Ontario Ministry of Health Promotion is interested in whether you're collecting any data in this area to support um, uh, research. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Uh, yes, uh, one part of our uh, uh, job for our organization is we are doing health promotion not only among youth but all, among all refugee communities. Um, uh, we also, we all working uh, in collaboration uh, with the Ministry of Health and also local DHBs. 
So from point to time, we have uh, presented from uh, local health bodies to our groups and to our, to, to, to our teams in terms of health promotion and also in terms of uh, not only for youth, for adult refugees also we have health promotion and also health uh, nutrition and also health uh, physical activities for health, especially among the refugee communities here we have some uh, issues like diabetes and also heart uh, diseases also there are sometimes there are uh, issues here so we promote physical activities for refugees, uh, not only for youth, for adults as well. Thank you very uh, much. In Australia, uh, we, we have um, what we call the Victorian uh, Health uh, Promotion Foundation, uh, and we uh, a lot of the sporting clubs, uh, local and elite, uh, form partnerships with this organisation, which is money provided through the Victorian government to help um, sporting clubs and local community clubs with fitness, uh, programs uh, for young people and also uh, as I mentioned earlier with the Sports Without Borders program, uh, the Youth Action program uh, aims precisely that, to do that, involve young people in physical activity regardless of their skill or fitness and purely look at their, um, to look at enhancing their levels of um, fitness and, and address issues of obesity and um, uh, reluctance of uh, undertaking sport. Thank you. So I think that uh, a lesson for all of us is how important it is to recognize the, the, the multiple perspectives, so the multiple um, ways in which um, one can sort of uh, create success locally by tapping into uh, different interests from within the community, different benefits that can be derived from this work. Um, and we certainly heard about some wonderful work going on in Auckland and in Melbourne today. We, we have come to the end of our... I'm going to ask one more quick question, uh, again from Rick Beaver, uh, because now I'm intrigued too. He wants to know in plain language, what is sport technology-driven process? Um, and I think that was a term used by um, our Melbourne uh, colleagues. So if one of you would like to, to provide a really quick uh, definition of what that is, that would help. Yes, uh, Dash will do that. Okay. Um, I have, I have to Luckily, I have seen it in action. I guess what's involved is um, leg technology, so sensor, sensor um, movement or picking up sensor movement and bands on distant hands. So I guess as they move through gates, uh, results are recorded that way. So it may be their speed or it may be how high they jump or, or whatever, I guess whatever the, the activity stipulates. So it, it, I guess in essence it is um, sen using sensors to measure their, their fitness and health. Okay. All right. So it's not about cyber sport or you have some of the... No, 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 no. This, this is about going back to the question about the issues of obesity and, and fitness and health levels. And, nice. and we've developed this technology uh, through which we use through Sports Without Borders as well as the other elite clubs. So I can just add uh, it, just how important research is. Today we uh, hear in the, in the report a research that has just come out from the Victorian Health Foundation where uh, young kids, uh, people who develop school uniforms uh, are finding that they have to increase the sizes of young men's or young boys' school shirts simply because of obesity. Isn't that interesting? Can I just mention the reason behind that whole project? Um, in Australia, we've got national standards for numeracy and literacy, but currently there's no standard or anything, I guess, that measures or gives us a benchmark for physical activity or fitness of our children. So I guess that's where Sports Without Borders um, came in and, and tried to fill the gap. That's excellent. So in conclusion, like all good ideas, Cities of Migration hopes to stimulate new thinking and engage integration practitioners and urban leadership in a, in a productive dialogue about, what one, about one of the most important global challenges facing cities today. Um, and would like to thank you once again for coming together to think about these issues with us in the Learning Exchange.